Hi everyone, welcome to Test 2020 online. This is a fireside chat session. I am Lena Patterson. I am the Senior Director of Programs and Stakeholder Relations at eCampus Ontario. And I am thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Michelle Pekansky-Brock. Michelle is faculty at Foothills De Anza Community College District, uh, is joining us all the way from California virtually, and is the author of Best Practices for Teaching with Emerging Technologies. So Michelle is also a leader in the Humanize Online um, movement that is um, circulating much more prominently these days. And um, in our conversations, um, you know, we, we identified Michelle early as the perfect person to join us and discuss humanizing learning. And some of the topics that Michelle and I are gonna be covering today include the effective dimensions of learning, and that's effective with an A, um, emotional armor, and creating spaces to support all students, particularly those that have experienced trauma. So in preparation for that conversation, Michelle and I both agreed that it was really important uh, to share our personal positionality as an effort to recognize social position and power dynamics. So I'm going to start um, and I am going to note that I am a white cisgendered woman that I am living in Canada, in Toronto, uh, as a settler on, indig in, on Indigenous land, and that I am not a person living with a disability. And so that shapes my perspective in these conversations, and I want to note that. And I wonder if you, Michelle, would uh, kindly do the same. Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. First of all, thanks so much for having me here, Lena. I'm so honored and excited to be part of this conversation today and um, I do appreciate uh, that we are beginning with our positionality. I think anytime we talk about equity it's so important to share the lens through which we are coming into this conversation because that obviously shapes every way that we think about things. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I live in California on uh, Native American land and um, I am the granddaughter of two white European immigrants. So my parents were first generation Americans. Um, I am cisgender, I am heterosexual, and I, I live in an abled, for the most part, abled body. Um, I consider myself as someone who has a, uh, an invisible disability. Um, I actually have a mechanical heart valve that um, limits some things I can do. But for the most part, I live in a, in a very abled body. And um, yeah, so as I just said, you know, that informs the way that we see things and it um, grants both of us privileges. And those privileges can really obscure the realities and the experiences of others who don't live in a dominant um, type of identity. So uh, it's very important to be aware and critically examining those biases um, that we have. Thanks, Michelle. That's really helpful um, framing as well for, for the conversation. So I want to start, if we can, at kind of the baseline um, question, which is what is humanizing um, in your own words? Such a simple question um, <laughs> that has such a complicated answer. I think... I think to answer that question, first of all, it's important to take a step back and recognize that humans are social beings and connection and belonging are basic needs for humans. Um, that's really where all of this stems from. And in higher education, we are very likely to put away the touchy-feely stuff and expect students as well as ourselves to kind of leave our emotions at the door. Um, but that's not the way learning happens. And um, I actually have a quote that I'd like to read to you that has 
just been so important to me. And it's a quote, I want to just say it's, it's, it's a quote from uh, two neuro, neuroscientists named Mary Helen Imordino Yang and Antonio Damasio. So this is considered like bleeding edge neuroscience. Emotions are not just messy toddlers in a china shop running around breaking and obscuring delicate cognitive glassware. Instead, they are more like the shelves underlying the glassware. Hmm. Without them, cognition has less support. Oh, wow. So that notion that, you know, leave leave your feelings at the door, buckle down and, and learn this. It's, it's a misnomer. We can't separate the way we feel from, from behaving, from the way we behave. And so our, we have to feel good about something before we're going to lean in and do it. And that, that's very true for a college course. So um, what humanizing is, is first of all, it's an effort to recognize that it's very easy and very common for online courses to not have a human presence, to not have Mm -hmm. a human connection. And we see this in research about online courses. And we know that when students identify that they're connected in a course with a real person, their instructor and real people, their peers, they are more likely to do better in the course. And it goes back to that emotional connection. Um, So, in the California community college system, this is where the, the humanizing practices that, that, that I am invested in started emerging more than 10 years ago. I consider it a grassroots teaching effort. Um, and it's, you know, I don't want to suggest that like it's this way and the only way, but humanizing to me does mean something very specific and it continues to evolve. So it's about ensuring that faculty understand the importance of that emotional, social and emotional piece. And it's also about ensuring that they have strategies Mm -hmm. in their back pocket to draw upon. And they, Mm -hmm. they feel they have the self-efficacy about using certain digital tools to implement those strategies. So that's what humanizing is in a nutshell. That's wonderful. And I think, you know, what you alluded to at the beginning is that a lot of the um, structures and processes that we may have in academia either discourage or just don't fully um, recognize maybe the importance of, of that aspect, um, even though it has such a strong um, you know, research foundation, neuroscientists and, and learning theorists alike. Right, yeah, there's lots of research that shows how important it is and like you said in the learning sciences too there's a whole effective domain in uh, Mm -hmm. bloom's taxonomy but often it's just it's that cognition that we're so rooted in and so invested in so yes so you started something called the humanizing challenge for faculty um in in the california community college system um and I wonder if you can just explain to us, you know, why you why you were compelled to start that, um, and and when you did, and how it's taken shape since then. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, in the role that I serve, um, I am in a full time faculty online faculty development role, and so we do have different opportunities for faculty to get engaged with humanizing. Most of those opportunities exist within online facilitated courses that we offer that have limited enrollments or only offered a few times a year. And it was in late July, oh, maybe early July, but we started Mm -hmm. thinking, what could we do to support as many faculty as possible with this incredibly difficult fall term upon us? And so... um, we wanted to do something public. We wanted to do something free. And mm. uh, we came up with the concept of the humanizing challenge. So it was a three day event that took participants through um, different aspects of humanizing. So learning about we, the, the anatomy of learning, that was one of the concepts, this notion of emotional armor, which can really get in the way of ourselves leaning in and engaging with these ideas. Um, and 
really to challenge individuals to complete certain mini um, tasks during those three days. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't actually just open to uh, those folks in our system. It was public. We had, we had people from South Africa join us, oh, people wow. from Canada. Yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of interest. And I, I, I think that that was a really beautiful feeling to see so many with all the things that faculty were contending with mm. in early August, 2020 to stop and say, I'm going to do this. And it was, it was really pretty beautiful. That's amazing to hear. There's something so incredible when those barriers break down and people start coming in from all over the world. It's like this absolutely expansive experience for everybody involved. And it really, I mean, it really kind of, um, leverages the full power of the internet to create community, right, for people, um, especially in times when it can be, when, when things can feel quite, when everyone can feel quite lonely or, or like they're kind of, you know, out on this, um, on this edge and uh, that there's no one there with them who's also experiencing the same kinds of challenges. Yeah, and if I can build on to that, um... As you were speaking, it just reminded me that we also had at the end of each day, we had a, a Padlet, which a public Padlet, which is like a digital bulletin board that we invited participants to post the work to. So yeah. like the final step was, OK, like now you made that brief and perfect video. Now share it with us. Share it with the world. Now you made this liquid syllabus, which I'm sure we'll get to later. Um, share it with the world. And that was really incredible to see folks take that final step and really yeah. be proud of what they did. So yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was really neat. Yeah. I mean, how, how important was the framing of the humanizing challenge to, to help people get to that place where they felt ready to share something that was imperfect with the world? That was very intentional. Um, yeah. I thought a lot about that. And so we had these kind of um, pretty traditional webinars that, uh, type event that we did every day to kind of start the day. But on that first day, I also invited um, two faculty who had taught for the first time online last year to sit with me in just a, an unscripted kind of fireside chat um, mm -hmm. experience and just talk about what it was like to teach online for the first time and then what, yeah. it, what, what it was like when COVID hit. And that real raw experience um, allowed us to really kind of go into these spaces and be very honest about things that were hard and mm -hmm. things that are hard and things that are difficult. And, um, you know, a lot of that came down to this, like, this challenge with really wanting to do things perfectly and flawlessly and recognizing that we had to accept that that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Um, yeah. and it's still really hard, but that was, that was kind of a common theme, uh, when we opened up this dialogue about emotional armor. Um, and I think hearing others reflect on that was an important first step in encouraging everyone to think about uh, that aspect of themselves. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just thinking back, I'm like trying in the back of my mind right now, I'm trying to push down the idea that I might've stumbled a little bit in my intro and you're making me feel so much better, Michelle. <laughs> I think it's going to be okay. Um, so I wonder if you um, can tell me a little bit about, there's three questions that frame the humanizing challenge, right? And I think those are really rich questions. And, and I would love to kind of pick each one and ask you to reflect on each one because they really get to, um, to the core, I think, of what it is that you're trying to do and some of the complexity that lives there. So um, the first question is, how do instructor-student relationships serve as the connective tissue? I love that. I love that phrase. Serve as the connective tissue for engagement and community. And if you can reflect on this, both from a face-to-face perspective and from an online perspective, because I think we, we maybe need to consider both going forward. There's work, there's research that was done by Laura Rendon back in the 1990s. And the research had nothing to do with online courses, okay? It had to do with face-to-face -face courses. And her research was specifically conducted with uh, first-generation college students, and what Rendon did was she did qualitative 
um, research. So she interviewed these first generation students towards the end of their academic career. So they were about to kind of, to kind of they're in the, the ending yeah. part of the, yeah. of our traditional four year degree in the United States. And one of the questions that she asked was how did, when did you know, when did you know in your academic pathway that you could do this, mm. that you were going to be successful, that you were going to make it to the end, yeah. that you were going to make it. Because we know that first generation students, which are largely often comprised also of racially minoritized students, um, low income students, uh, they are they, they enter with an incredible amount of self doubt. They're socially stigmatized as higher education being an academic is not, mm -hmm. you know, something that's kind of part of, of our social of of our social conversation. They're not represented in the media in that way, oftentimes mm -hmm. may not be encouraged to go on to college. And even if they are, like all of these broader social messages can 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 rub against the grain of what what they're fully capable of achieving. So um, asking that question revealed some very interesting things. And one of the most important things it revealed was this sense of connecting with an educator. So um, the, the, the data surfaced themes like the first time an instructor took the time to remember my name, like something as simple as that. The first time that I saw an instructor be a partner in my learning. Mm -hmm. um, and so Laura Rendon's work became known as validation theory. And this idea that validating our students is really, really important. And that's all about a relationship. It's about connection. So, you know, when we think about the same student population learning online, what we see is that there are existing equity gaps in face-to-face -face college courses. So white and Asian students are much more likely to succeed than black, Latinx, indigenous um, students. That's true face-to-face. -face. And when we look at the data from online courses, those gaps are actually exacerbated. They get mm -hmm. worse. That's a really big problem. And it's not something we should sweep under the carpet. It's something we need to dig into and figure out how to improve. Um, and so taking that theory and applying it to online courses makes perfect sense. And it's actually what we, we've been doing for so long in this kind of humanizing movement. So... I don't want to imply that it was like it, it emerged as like, oh, this is what the research says. Let's do it. It was more like grounded in teaching and right. seeing students respond certain ways and yeah. teachers having the sense that these practices work. And then over time, it's been about connecting them to the research. So um, but that's why that's why that, that connective tissue is so important. And then the other piece of it, Lena, is uh, culturally responsive teaching. And there's this uh, concept from culturally responsive teaching called warm demander pedagogy. It's rooted in the work of Judith Kleinfeld. And what it, what it means and why it's so important to this is that it's really important to understand that it's not just, humanizing is not just about the relationship. It doesn't stop there. Right. The relationship is the foundation that instructors leverage to challenge students to push them, to encourage them. I believe in you. I know you can do this. Look what you've done to really be that intrusive person who's mm -hmm. there to continue to push and um, encourage students to really kind of go beyond what they think they can do right. and really achieve their full intellectual capacity. So um, that's why I think of relationships as that connective tissue. You know, it's um, it's it, it's vital, but it also doesn't end there. That pedagogy piece yeah. is really important. It's a bit, it's a foundational aspect that that gets built on. Yeah. Yeah. But but I mean, I think what you your your point um, from the validation theory research, which was which is so striking about just you know remembering someone's name, um, that is that is this easy thing, right? That's something that it, it takes no extra training, no extra technology, you know, no extra anything um, to do that. And so I think the thing that I find really exciting about this is that 
is that there's huge potential to make significant change um, with, with just a little bit of reflection and awareness. And so that might get us into uh, the next question, which is a little bit more practical and which you alluded to um, previously um, with some of the, the, the tools um, and strategies that you use. Um, so the question is about how we might create online courses that initiate those positive connections um, upon first entry into the course, um, you know, and that can be, that's face-to-face -face or online, but maybe given um, the position we're in right now, we should focus in on online um, strategies um, because they are, they are unique, right? About yeah. how, how faculty can begin to make those early connections. Yeah, so I think it starts with thinking about our course as an experience, um, and, you know, we see it so profoundly right now that faculty want, like, that, there's that craving for connecting with students. It's, yeah. there's such a loss right now. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I, it's really fascinating because there's such a tendency right now to use Zoom. And I do really, really believe that that's coming from you know, such a good place. It's coming from the desire to want your students to be in front of you so that you can connect with them. Um, but oftentimes what we don't recognize is that connection can happen through asynchronous online courses. And so humanizing is really looking at the asynchronous online modality. And when we're learning asynchronously online, it's that start of the course that is, um, it's murky. Yeah. Um, so students know they're in, they're enrolled in a course. They may they may know like oh well courses start on that day, but what does that mean to me as an online student? If there isn't like you know a place that I need to be sitting for a certain amount of time, and so what we try to get faculty to really think about is to make a pre course contact, warm humanized pre course contact mm -hmm. by sending out an email before the course begins. And in that email, including a link to what, what we call a liquid syllabus, um, and a liquid syllabus is different than just a digital like PDF file. It's actually using a website tool to create a syllabus. Um, and the liquid syllabus is really intended to be a pared down version of the full fledged syllabus, at least what students get mm -hmm. before, the, before the, the course starts. We don't want to overwhelm them. We want to greet them. We want to welcome them. And that's one of the values of a website tool is that you can embed a video of yourself right at the top. So, you know, um, when students are on a phone and they check this email, which they're most likely to do on a phone, and they tap the mm -hmm. link, it opens instantly. They're not greeted with a login screen. Um, another way we theorize about humanizing is sending these uh, uh, cues of social affirmation. So a login screen is not a cue of social affirmation, but a just, you know, a web page that opens that, that, um, that renders beautifully on a phone, um, unlike a PDF does, is, mm, yeah. is really a different experience. And so having that brief welcome, that imperfect welcome video where you're greeted by a warm, friendly face, but then you also have tips for success that maybe the due dates for week one, materials mm -hmm. that they absolutely have to have in week one, um, and then something called a learning pact. And a pact is a list of mm -hmm. things that you expect of your students, but also what your students can expect from you. And so what we're trying to do is cue students, send these cues that you will be a partner in their learning, um, break down that hierarchy that uh, that instructor to student hierarchy that can serve as such a barrier and um, really start to make efforts to foster trust with students instead of just expecting students to trust us and lean in. We have to have those efforts to, to build that trust. So I think that's how, that's what we mean when we say from the first click, right? It's, it's really trying to be intentional about being sure that our human presence um, connects with our students before they're logging in and trying to figure out where to go. Mm -hmm. But then using those videos, you know, um, this is such a powerful teaching tool. Learning how to record video on your phone of yourself and upload it somewhere like YouTube where it can be captioned or, you know, wherever your institution 
um, has videos, uh, sir, uh, host, host videos, captioning them, teaching faculty how to caption those videos, brief videos, not like hour long videos. Yeah. I'm talking like 30 second, one minute, two yeah. minute videos. Max three minutes maybe. Yeah, and embedding yeah. them in, in places in the course where you know they'll kind of scaffold the student and, and welcome them and walk mm-hmm. them through, especially that first week is so, so important. Um, and I'll just mention one more strategy. I can keep going because I actually have like a whole suite of eight of them. But well, I want to ask you about <laughs> some, one more thing. Yeah. Share something about syllabus before you. Are you still? Yeah. Do you still want to keep going on syllabus? No, go ahead. I was okay. going to move on. So just to close the syllabus piece. I mean, I'm a current current online student, and the syllabus. You know, first of all, you know they can be up to thirty. You know, thirty to forty pages PDF. Um, but they also tend to, um, you know, present more as a contract. Yeah. And um, policy uh, is up front and, um, and requirements, uh, requirement language, imperative language is also um, used, but heavily, right? So it's very hard to distinguish what, uh, sort through that document and what do I actually have to focus on, right? And so I love the language that you use about a learning pact because it's much more reciprocal um, and less punitive uh, as a starting point for, um, for the journey that you're you know, all going to embark on. Um, so that's all I wanted to add yeah. about the syllabus. Yes. I'm glad you said that, though, because now I do want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, because part of the syllabus, and this is not work that, like, the liquid syllabus is something that is specific to this, this kind of humanizing movement that, that I'm a part of. But there are so many scholars who have looked to the syllabus, like, as a, an important tool to deconstruct mm-hmm. and to redesign and rewrite in a way that is welcoming and supportive. The Center for Urban Education at the University of Southern California, um, they have a um, syllabus, I can't remember what they call it, syllabus tool that is is deeply rooted in racial equity. And so it, the notion of looking at your policies and saying, what kind of cue does that send to a student? You know, and, and rewriting it in a way that is positive, like focus on what you want students to do instead of what you don't want them to do. Um, and so that is a big part of it too. Uh, the other fascinating thing about websites is that it's, it's a link. So you can give your students the link right. and then you can actually adapt what they see. So it, I could just have my students see that one page with the, the content that I referenced before. But then when the course starts, I can toggle over to another page as the home page and then activate, you know, my policies and all the other right. goodies. So it, it, it really opens up a whole new way of thinking about ensuring that, yes, that syllabus is critical. It's got everything that the students need, but you can also adapt it so that they see what they need at that moment. Right. Yeah. Rather than putting the onus on them to deconstruct it and, you know, sort through, um, which, which, you know, may not, is very likely that many won't do, right? When, when the barriers are so high. Right. I don't know if you saw the Snoop Dogg video about reading the syllabus, but that was, I shared that with my, my colleagues right away that are um, in my program with me. Uh, it was funny. Um, so um, did you want to add something else about other, other tips that you use uh, in addition to the liquid syllabus? Yeah, I about? would mention one more that was part of the, the humanizing challenge, and it's the getting to know you survey, which is so simple yeah. too. But um, in that first week, reaching out to students with a survey, again, thinking about validation, that concept of validation, and having a survey that cues students, hey, this is, this is my effort to, to get to know some things about you, letting them know it's confidential, the answers are only going to go to you, and that you're going to use that information to support them throughout the course. And asking them things like, um, do you have any tips for pronouncing your name? What are your preferred mm-hmm. pronouns? Mm-hmm. Um, also, I'm going to leave you voice or video feedback this term, which is a humanizing practice. 
how do you feel about that? And letting them choose sound gr- sounds great or no thanks, I prefer written feedback. Right. Because a lot of the tools inside the learning management system for recording, if you have those tools, don't provide captioning. So that gives a student, you know, without, without you having to judge the reasons, it gives them an opportunity to say, no, I want written feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just two more questions. How are you feeling right now about this course in one word? Oh, one word. Well, that's hard. Huge. But the responses, <laughs> but yeah. the responses, you scan those responses and instantly you know who the students are that need your high touch. You know who we call them high opportunity students. You know who they are. Mm-hmm. The ones that say anxious, overwhelmed. Um, I would anticipate there's much more of them this term. And then the next question is, um, can you share one thing that you think might get in the way of your success in this course? And if Mm. students choose to share something there, you know, oftentimes traditionally you hear a lot about like, I'm really busy, I have to work, but you also learn about other things. Like um, last semester, I had a student say when I registered for this course, I was I was working 10 hours a week. Now, both of my parents have lost their jobs because of COVID and I'm working 50 yeah. hours a week to support my right. family. So you learn their stories yeah. and make notes about those and refer to those aspects during the course as you see them, maybe not engaging, right? You lean on that and you reach out individually. Hey, I'm thinking about you. I remember you shared this. Mm-hmm. What can I do to support you? So mm-hmm. um, I think that serves that validation piece pretty well. That's wonderful. And I love how you're not, I mean, you're not putting the onus on the student to, you know, write a specific email that says, hi, you know, I need you to know that X, Y, and Z, because the likelihood that they're going to do that is slim maybe. And, you know, I know that in my, in my class right now, I have many colleagues who work in the health profession, they're nurses, they're occupational therapists. And so their terms, you know, that we just had during COVID were, upside down um, in terms of what they were required to do and how much more time they needed. Um, And so, um, you know, the fact that the instructor that we had did, you know, learn about those things made a huge difference to them, I know, personally, Um, and they felt seen. um, And that's really important. Absolutely. That's what it's about, being seen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you said... You said something interesting, which is, um, you know, you know those students um, through these processes, you might be able to identify those students that need a little bit more support. Um, And you mentioned that there's more of them Mm. right now. Um, So before we, uh, maybe this moves into our next question, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But I wonder whether you can reflect on kind of... um, in this significant change for those faculty who are out there who, who are wanting to adopt all these things, who are wanting to, to um, make these adjustments to their courses to support, um, what does that mean for them and their kind of emotional health and, yeah. um, and, and how might they find balance um, in this as well? Because um, the last thing we want is um, the people who are there to support burning out, right? Yeah. And... I would say that your emotional health has to come first. Uh, And all of this, you know, the, the, this is hard work. We have this unfortunate term, you know, we like to call anything related to emotions, some, you know, soft skills that like, it it seems to minimize Mm -hmm. what we're talking about, but this is hard, brave, courageous work. And it's taxing. So it is really important to be aware of ourselves, to have time for self-care, to get fresh air, to turn off devices, Mm -hmm. to exercise, to meditate, to pet our our puppies and our kitties, to, you know, do those. Those things are really important to just keeping us grounded Um, and, and having boundaries is is part of this too it's not about opening every aspect of yourself to your students and letting every yeah. aspect of them in right. we are we are teachers so our our core focus is instruction so it, it's also very important to be aware of 
um, student services that are available to students like mental health services. So if, you know, you yeah. do have a student who you sense needs that support, that's, that's where you need to know that you aren't trained to go there and to help connect a student with someone who is trained in that expertise, that area of expertise. So I guess that's what I would say. Um, and it's hard because on the one hand, you know, I know that I'm, I'm talking a lot about this emotional armor, which emotional armor is something that we, we put on to keep ourselves from going into these vulnerable places. We don't like vulnerability. It feels yucky, but we have to move through vulnerability to get to empathy. And it's through empathy that connection emerges. And so, you know, that, that sequence is important and getting ourselves to, to, be vulnerable and understand that vulnerability, while it, this is from the work of Brene Brown, by the way, I have to cite her, her research um, has shown that vulnerability feels like weakness, but it looks like courage. And mm. I think that's a very powerful thing. Um, so it is about, you know, it is about figuring out where we are. And there's so much happening right now. And when I look at what what faculty are contending with right now. I, I mean, yeah, there are days where I think, Oh, I don't know. This is just so much. And I yeah. think the, the other piece of it is that, you know, make, do one thing, try one strategy. It doesn't mean you've got to do everything, but I think that's one of the beautiful things about trying to demonstrate strategies. It's just like, if you can take one thing and try it and see the impact, mm -hmm. then it will motivate you, I think, to build to upon that next time. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say about how emotional armor might get in the way of our ability to design humanized learning spaces? Like, what, what impact does that have um, if we hold tight to it? Um, where does that where does that leave us when it comes to, you know, these, these spaces we're trying to create for some of our most disadvantaged students? Yeah, I think I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of faculty over the years with using video. <laughs> and it is so hard yeah. to record a video and look back at it and hear your ums and your ahs and, you know, Never your awkward, awkward body <laughs> positioning and, yeah. and then being like, okay, now I'm going to upload it to YouTube. Like <laughs> even if you make it unlisted. So if it's unlisted, only the people you share it with will see it. But that is really hard, particularly for academics, you know, so um, because we're just, we're, we exist in this culture of being the knower, right? Being the, the, the expert. And so it's not true for everyone. I mean, I say this and I have faculty all the time who say, oh no, I'm so not like that. But I think to generalize, there's, that's a barrier. Um, and so seeing other people do it is a huge incentive. And that's why I'm so, I try so hard to, to get folks to share but I think the other piece of it is institutions should recognize the value of something like recording a brief and perfect video. I don't think they often do. Mm -hmm. And I think that we really need to see that as a skill set that all faculty need to have and be able to do and, and have the tools to do it. But I think what is important is that they need a, they need a, a place, they need they need a place for experimentation, a place that's supportive, a place where they can make mistakes and know that those mistakes will help them get better. Uh, those types of, of faculty to faculty connection points online are so important right now and vital to getting past our emotional armor because the more we see that it's not just us, it's everyone the easier it is to yeah. kind of cope with it all. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying reminds me of kind of, um, you know, the, the extra difficulty of being online if you're the one who's leading or facilitating or teaching, whatever. Um, and, you know, um, there's this has kind of come to a head recently, I think, in conversations about requiring video to be on for students or participants because 
you as the facilitator feel alone otherwise um, or exposed otherwise or I mean, there's a, there's a many different reasons. And I'm sure everybody has kind of a different spin on it. But um, what's your take on that? So um, I was part of a, a panel conversation recently with Vigi Sathy from um, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And she had this great answer. I can tell you my take, but her, her voice is resonating in my head. She, her response was, ask yourself, ask yourself why you want those cameras to be on. And if the answers are, I, 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 Mm -hmm. then it's important to recognize that you're doing it for you and not so much for your students. Yeah. And I thought that was a just brilliant response to that. Um, The way I think about it is humanizing at the core. It's about treating your students with dignity and respect and creating psychological safety and trust And for me, when you invite students into a Zoom session and, you know, hopefully they've already kind of, they know what your teaching philosophy is. That's another part of the liquid syllabus, like all that, hopefully, Mm -hmm. you know, that they know something about you. When you invite students in, you know, when when you say, welcome, I'm so happy to have you here today. I would be honored to be able to see you if that's something that is in your practice today, if you're comfortable turning on your webcam, if you're in a place that, you know, you, you feel like that's okay to do, um, I invite you to do that. And if not, that's fine too. That's, that sends one message, mm-hmm. but when it's, we're going to meet in Zoom and you need to turn on your webcam, that sends a very different message. Yeah. And that is more about that hierarchy that we want to try to break down. It's more about that, you know, dominance over students um so that's where i come from that's that's where i come from but with that said i also teach asynchronously yeah i was just gonna say this is you know it's a problem (laughs) removed however we know that you know um i think the the shift for to the asynchronous methods is is something that is happening a little bit more slowly post pandemic pivot um because the easiest thing to pop into a course calendar is that block. Absolutely. It, yeah, I, and it does. It, on the one hand, it makes sense. It's, it makes sense. But yeah. I do hope that we can start to see the barriers that that also does present to certain students. And yes. um, in my, I'm just, I'm a big advocate for asynchronous. So I need yeah. to get that, that bias out there. <laughs> Anytime, any place, yeah. anywhere. Yeah. So Michelle, I just want to close our conversation today um, by asking you uh, a bigger question um, that gets beyond um, and 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 into some other territory. So, I mean, we talked a lot about emotional armor and the effect of dimensions of learning and creating space to support all students. So, I wonder if you can help us unpack a little bit what you see as the connection between your work and the larger conversation that we are all a part of right now about systemic racism, injustice, and privilege. So I think it's a, it's a thread in a, in a more rich fabric, right? It's a, it's a piece and within courses, we also have to be examining our curriculum, um, decolonizing our curriculum. I think that's part of it too. I don't wanna suggest that uh, this is all we need to do as educators, but, mm-hmm. I think a couple of things. I think that as as educators, we often un, we often don't recognize the impact that we have on the future. Mm. And by touching people, by you know, racist environments look like this. By creating environments like this, where students feel, like you said, seen, where they feel trusted, they feel validated, that goes a long way. And that's going to encourage more students to keep going with their courses and achieve their goals. And when we start to see um, fewer reduced equity gaps, like, you know, uh, in terms of those who actually achieve four year degrees, um, yes, they're still going to have to then confront our racist workplaces. And but we're part of a systemic change when we're investing in making these 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 adjustments in our in our learning environments when we're invested in creating inclusive learning environments so it it does matter i just don't want to imply that it's all we should be doing um, we have a lot of work ahead of us 
Well, I really appreciate you joining us today, Michelle, um, from, from California, supporting this conference in this way. I mean, I think that your voice is just such a critical one in this conversation, and I really hope um, that our paths will cross again um, in the near future. So I want to thank you for being here with us for TESS Online 2020. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be included.